So uh, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick introduction basically to QCWare um, and, uh, and about kind of most of the work that we're doing is around making sure that enterprises are ready uh, to deal with uh, quantum computing. Where does it fit into their processes? What are the use cases? What are the applications that we can use quantum computing for? Um, so we are uh, a primarily a software company. That's why it's in the middle. Uh, but we do a lot of professional services. That's how we engage typically with uh, large enterprises to help them and advise them about applications. And we, most of the time, augment their R&D group. So we publish research together, basically, with uh, our enterprise customers. Okay. And then we also do this event, right? So actually, you might have seen me up on the keynote stage because we uh, try to foster the quantum computing community. And so we put Q2B together and uh, make sure that the vendors get in together with the uh, corporations and with the government organizations. So um, the first thing uh, that I want to highlight is basically how we're different from hardware vendors. So hardware manufacturers, every time you hear them talking about uh, what they do, uh, it's all about we are building uh, computers with more qubits and better quality qubits, and this is natural. Uh, when you hear us talking about what the things that we do, it's all about how we can use essentially fewer resources on the quantum hardware, how we can reduce the resources, let's say, from 100,000 gates down to uh, potentially 10,000 gates to uh, run a specific problem, or how we can use maybe the same number of gates but actually get better performance out of an algorithm, right? And obviously, these are two fronts, right, that have to essentially meet in the middle to actually get to practical quantum applications that provide an advantage, right? So uh, we are coming again from reducing the hardware resources perspective, and our hardware partners come from the side of actually increasing the, uh, the hardware resources. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what we've done over the last year. So I'm going to talk about essentially all the engagements we did with customers uh, over the last 12 months, uh, since essentially the last time we were uh, up here on stage. Um, and let's start with the, uh, uh, yeah, the things we've published, the papers we've published with several uh, large corporations. Uh, so this is uh, one of the first ones. We did it late in December of last year, uh, right after this conference last year, basically. We published this paper with uh, the pharmaceutical giant, Roche. We uh, worked on these quantum transformers. So transformers uh, are basically very popular now because of ChatGPT architecture, neural network architecture. And they typically use for language, um, but uh, we essentially took that into the vision space and the imaging space, and we looked at quantum uh, transformers, quantum vision transformers. And uh, effectively, what we did is basically look at uh, images, retina scans, actually, and looked at how we can classify whether these retina scans, these retina scans come from um, um, uh, patients with diabetes and what type of diabetes. So this is kind of the detection that we did. And the interesting thing here is that basically we were able to uh, replicate the performance of classical neural networks that had tens of millions of parameters. We were able to replicate that on quantum neural networks that only had very, very few, few hundred parameters, really. Uh, so this is, uh, means that basically we can train quantum neural networks faster. Uh, they're more descriptive. They can understand what's happening in the environment much, much uh, easier and, and better. And it kind of paves the way to uh, better uh, AI ML techniques on the quantum computer. And this was done on, on the hardware execution was done on IBM. And we've already published this result uh, in, uh, uh, on the archive. I'm not sure if, if it has already appeared on, on a journal. Um, here's another uh, big uh, pharmaceutical uh, customer of ours, AstraZeneca. In this case, we looked at uh, essentially filling in the data from clinical trials, right? So typically clinical trials start and you have a lot of uh, uh, people uh, participate in the trial. They have to execute several steps uh, as part of the trial. But then during the trial, you have several people actually fall out and don't actually complete all the steps. So you have a lot of gaps into the data. And, um, and AstraZeneca was considering, okay, how do we, how can we fill in this data so we can actually run some experiments and we can uh, uh, make some predictions and, and create some insights out of the data, right? Uh, and obviously they wanted to do this responsibly and they wanted to do this with the help of the auditor and the regulator, right? Uh, so uh, we helped them essentially do that, again, with uh, the help of uh, quantum neural networks. And um, again, this is published on, uh, 
on a paper with, uh, with them, with AstraZeneca. Uh, we've worked uh, very extensively over a long uh, uh, period of years with Aishin. Aishin is the largest transition manufacturer in the world. If you're driving a Toyota car, uh, I'm 99% sure that you have an Aishin transmission in, inside your car. And we've been working with them for several years. And um, we developed several approaches on quantum annealing uh, and actually quantum reinforcement learning for vehicle routing, right? So, uh, so we actually took a different path than what's typical. Uh, when we do vehicle routing, we took a, a machine learning approach, a reinforcement learning approach, and we published several papers with them. And this uh, latest, uh, the date there is from our latest uh, communication that we had uh, together. Um, we, as you see, we work extensively in pharmaceuticals. So this example uh, addresses essentially the holy grail in uh, pharmaceutical space, right? So how do you design essentially better drugs? How do you detect the uh, binding forces between potential drugs and the protein in which they want to fit? And, and so we looked at um, this specific problem, and actually we looked at it in the context of fault tolerant quantum computers, right? So actually, in this case, we work together not only with Boringer Ingelheim, but with Psi Quantum. And we uh, took uh, a technique called symmetry adapted perturbation theory, and basically we um, coded this technique on a quantum computer. And, and basically, uh, we looked at how you, how you would run this technique on a, on a uh, fault tolerant quantum computer. Again, the results are, are, are published. You can easily find them on our, on our website. Again, earlier this year in May, we uh, published a paper with J.P. Morgan Chase, and we announced our collaboration with them. Um, we looked at quantum reinforcement learning methods. In this case, uh, we looked at uh, essentially new uh, trading strategies. So how would you do trading, basically, uh, using a quantum agent uh, that's going to inform you, basically, of the different chaotic motions, basically, in the markets, and how do you essentially train a neural network to, uh, to make uh, trading decisions? Um, and the paper is published. Uh, what's interesting about this paper, and you might have seen this in, in a couple of the other slides, uh, but now I'm going to highlight it, is that some of these techniques actually apply uh, on, obviously, on QPUs, on, on quantum processing units. But um, uh, some of them were able to transfer over and run in the classical domain on GPUs. They don't run as well, uh, but you can still get an advantage over what they were doing uh, before, what, uh, in this case, J.P. Morgan Chase was doing before. Um, and I believe this experiment run on Honeywell's machine, uh, even though I don't highlight it here on the slide, I, I think this was an experiment we did on, on Honeywell's machine. Uh, this is another bank. Uh, actually, it's the largest uh, bank in Latin America. It's Itaú Unibanco. It's, uh, uh, in this case, we were working with the retail part of the bank, and we looked at credit risk modeling. Again, we published a paper in, uh, in May, end of May, and we looked at essentially how do we classify risk, risk of individuals, basically credit risk, lending risk, uh, again, by using um, uh, quantum neural network techniques. And uh, again, the interesting thing here was that we were able to essentially get very similar results to what you can do classically, but with vastly fewer parameters, right? So again, you know, we're able to train faster, use much more smaller networks. And actually, in many cases, these smaller quantum neural networks can be more interpretable because they, they don't uh, have these, these large sizes of parameters. Um, we, uh, later in June, we talked about um, our work with Airbus. Actually, we're doing maritime anomaly detection. So again, in the machine learning space. Um, and um, it's a little bit weird that we're doing maritime detection, anomaly detection, with Airbus, but that's kind of what they wanted to concentrate on. And this is part of an ongoing uh, collaboration. We haven't published a paper on this yet, but the teams are still working together. Um, back in July, we announced uh, the, um, uh, our collaboration with Welcome Leap. Welcome Leap is this big foundation. You might have seen other presentations uh, here in, in this conference and other winners uh, of this award. Uh, so Welcome Leap basically announced this award for, um, um, uh, for applying essentially quantum computing for uh, problems in the healthcare space. And we created this um, um, uh, collaboration with Ross and Harvard and Mass General Hospital. And we all applied together basically for, for this award. And again, the um, 
the theme uh, for our approach is basically taking MRI data, MRI scans, um, and uh, doing image recognition with machine learning approaches on these MRI scans. And, and, um, and that's basically our, our proposal was awarded uh, one of the 10 uh, awards that were given uh, by Welcome Leap. Um, we are continuing our collaboration with BMW. I've talked in the past about how we work with BMW. Uh, in this case, we're doing uh, this prediction of uh, uh, essentially the 3D printed uh, uh, printer uh, in the assembly uh, room. So this is obviously for, for advanced manufacturing. Uh, but basically, they have these large 3D printers. They have essentially hundreds of parameters uh, to, uh, to control the 3D printer. And actually, in many cases, they're still trying to figure, okay, what are the best parameters to use uh, the 3D printer to actually uh, print out all the components uh, they need to produce in the assembly line. And, uh, and they're using classical machine learning techniques. And our challenge was, okay, can we, can we help them essentially by using uh, quantum machine learning techniques to improve on the results uh, of, this, of these predictions. And the last project that we just announced, uh, actually earlier today, we just had a press release together with uh, POSCO Holdings earlier today. Uh, so POSCO Holdings is uh, uh, a very large uh, steel manufacturer out of Korea. And um, uh, we, uh, together with POSCO Holdings, we applied for a, a Korean government grant uh, on chemistry simulation, basically simulation of solid state electrolytes for, for lithium batteries, right? So they do all kinds of, all sorts of material exploration. And, um, and our proposal was about figuring out how do we use quantum computing techniques to do the simulation of the materials of the batteries in this case that overcome some of the challenges that classical techniques uh, like DFT, for example, have in predicting uh, good results basically for these, uh, for these batteries, okay? Um, so this is basically uh, what we've done over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, I want to bring your attention to uh, a presentation we're going to do, a webinar we're going to do together with SciQuantum uh, in January. So you can uh, point your, uh, your phone to the QR code over there on the screen. Uh, so in, uh, on January 24th, uh, together with SciQuantum, we're going to essentially present uh, um, a, a way to collaborate with both of us and, and think about essentially chemistry simulation on fault tolerant architectures and, and what we could be doing uh, together. Uh, so a little bit on the software side and how are we doing on time? Okay, so we got a little bit more time. Uh, so on the software side, I wanna kind of lay out uh, um, our vision for how we're gonna get to quantum advantage. Uh, specifically, I have one uh, set of slides for chemistry simulation and then another set of slides for machine learning. So specifically on, in chemistry simulation, uh, what we see out there in the market today are these legacy codes that have been essentially been in use for the last 20, 30 years. So these legacy codes attempt to basically uh, simulate these very large systems. So the protein, you got the protein, which is the large, uh, the large uh, system uh, with these big essentially bands and, and curls. And then you have the more, uh, the smaller system inside, which is essentially part of the a drug or part of the pocket that this drug is going to essentially uh, work in. And um, what typically happens is that you have this uh, one method, one type of methods, these approximate methods, force field methods, um, essentially acting on the bigger system because these methods uh, are approximate, they don't give you exact results, and therefore they're able to deal with a larger system. And you have uh, these other methods which are more exact and tell you ex exactly how the chemical system, uh, chemical bonds and uh, chemical properties of these, of these uh, systems behave. And, um, but in these legacy codes, essentially for the exact methods, we're limited to using uh, 20, 30 year old codes that run on CPUs, right? And that's why that uh, system there that's essentially more high definition and kind of you can see essentially the bonds and the, uh, the atoms uh, is, is very limited, right? Uh, so we kind of saw, saw that as a big gap into uh, in the current uh, composition basically of chemistry simulation software. So uh, what we're proposing is to use uh, the same uh, GPU techniques for the bigger system, the protein uh, and the bands with the bands and the curls, and then essentially use a GPU code 
uh, that we can essentially now have built from scratch to run on GPUs and uh, and simulate that internal uh, part of the of the protein and the the pocket sorry the protein pocket and the and the drug more exactly and that runs on GPU and that's why now we can actually go to a much larger system uh, for the, that center and now into the future <clears throat> what we're proposing is essentially the same thing but treating a smaller uh, part of this uh, of this uh, system on a quantum processing unit with a quantum computing algorithm to get even uh, better accuracy uh, and better results on that smaller pocket. Um, because in some cases, in some cases that best classical is all you need, right? So it kind of works well. It's essentially uh, using these DFT techniques and we, these are very well characterized. They've been in use for uh, decades really. And uh, in many cases they work great. But in some cases, because of exotic materials, right in the middle there of, of kind of the system that you're trying to uh, simulate and trying to basically characterize, you have these exotic materials that essentially DFT can, doesn't really do a good uh, job on. And that's why um, we're going to put those on the quantum computer. So today, we already have this uh, Prometheum, our Prometheum software available to do this middle piece. And then we're working towards essentially getting um, quantum uh, uh, processing units as they become a bigger and bigger connected into Prometheum uh, to help you get basically to this uh, right hand side of the screen. Okay. And uh, let me go a little bit faster. I'm going to skip over this slide. I just wanted to show you basically the difference in calculation between what we have today versus kind of what was being used, uh, legacy uh, software codes up until now. Uh, so you can see um, how many DFT calculations can you do in a day is basically the, uh, the key question. And if you use basically all the legacy codes, you maybe end up up to 300 uh, systems. Uh, if you use Prometheum, you're an order of magnitude faster, basically, because the code has been written from scratch and, and runs on GPUs, and, and that's much faster. Okay, um, and we've done kind of the standard things that now everybody expects from a new enterprise uh, B2B software. So it's SaaS, it's pay-as-you-go, it uses the latest NVIDIA GPUs on the cloud, and it uses the AWS cloud, actually. So, um, so it's very easy to access. There's really no uh, barrier to entry, no upfront cost, and, um, and you can easily scale up and down depending on how many of these systems you actually want to run. <clears throat> So very quickly, I also want to talk about QC Learn. This is kind of our approach and our, our quantum and quantum-inspired machine learning library. It's there for the computational, uh, sorry, for the uh, uh, quantum computing engineer and also the, the regular data scientist, the, the, uh, the data scientist that just wants to basically run something faster on GPUs today, right? So QC Learn extends these popular uh, machine learning frameworks and you can, depending on which user you are, you can take the results and run them on the quantum computer. Or if you're a, a data scientist uh, that just wants to see if you can run something uh, a little bit better today on your classical machine learning pipeline, uh, you can, again, use QC Learn. There are some techniques in there that are quantum inspired and can improve how your pipeline runs today on GPUs. Okay, so with that, um, let me just... Uh, Skip over and see, do we have any time for questions maybe? We're running pretty late. Okay, so we, I'll, I'll just wrap up um, and I'll talk about what we do in our community up on our, on our main stage with, uh, for the rest of the event. So thank you very much for, for joining us.